Robert Plank Show Episode 268. Stand out from the crowd for better visibility, credibility, and results with Peter Mahit. Hey everyone and welcome back to the program. Thanks for tuning in today and we're having a discussion right now with Peter Mahit and he's a veteran of both the Fortune 500 and tech startups and Peter has worked worldwide as a business process troubleshooter and outsourcing deal leader for Computer Sciences Corporation. He has participated in internet and consumer product startups and has started four of his own companies and he's been the owner of Custom Business Planning and that is at custombps.com, uh, Custom Business Planning and Solutions. So custombps.com, and he's the author of Killer Business Plan, Why You Need It, How to Write It. So, Mr. Peter, how are things today? Things are fantastic. It's great to be on your show, Robert. Thank you. It's great to have you, and thank you right back at you. And so this whole thing about, like, the, uh, you know, all this, like, kind of business planning and, like, the like the MBA stuff, like, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with it because, like, on one hand, it's like, well, you know, I tell myself that I'm not a... I'm not a business major or whatever, and I just want to focus on like sort of like my computer programming stuff or the stuff I do in my business. Uh, and then I also kind of get overwhelmed by like some of the jargon that gets thrown out. And on the other hand, I know that well, there, there's kind of a need for it because I see people who know you know even less than I do, and they're kind of flying by to the seat of their, of their pants with their business. And money is always kind of going faster than it's coming in. And so, I mean, like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you kind of see that? Do you see like that sort of that resistance to people knowing some of this business stuff? Yeah, I've been doing this for 13 years, and I'll tell you, uh, people hate doing it. But I'll tell you what I will tell. Uh, my whole thinking about writing a business plan or creating a business plan has kind of evolved over the course of time. I don't care whether you write your business plan on a bunch of sticky notes and put it on your wall, you put it in a three-ring binder, a spiral-bound notebook, or a Ouija board, however you want to do it. But you still need to go through the discipline of visualizing and thinking about how your business is going to run, what it looks like in the end state where you want it to be, say, in two years, five years, six years, and in – Everybody that's got a great idea, they just want to jump up and go. You know, they just want to get things done. And there's a whole world of investors out there and different schools of thought about agile startups and doing a lean, a lean startups and, and doing the startup canvas and that kind of stuff. And the fact of the matter is, is at the end of the day, once you've got your idea figured out, the business is the machine that delivers whatever you're selling, your software to whoever's buying it, and gets the, the money and the compensation back to you. So you still have to design that machine. I mean, I started my, my career in, in, uh, out in, with welders, you know, doing pipelines and, and that kind of construction. And these guys could figure stuff out on the back of a napkin or on, on a piece of scrap of paper, but they still had to figure out how they were going to cut the thing and put it in and, and, and fit it. So there's no escaping it. And I think that the more time that you spend up front thinking about something, how you're going to do something, the better off you're going to be. I mean, you don't see star athletes or great musicians or great painters they don't just pick pick up a brush and create a masterpiece or get a basketball and uh, sink three pointers. They practice and practice and practice. And really, writing a business plan is your rehearsal and your practice to succeed in your business. Awesome, it makes perfect sense. And I like that analogy of the the construction stuff because it sounds like if people don't have this kind of plan, they'll they'll back themselves in, into a corner in that way. And it also sounds like um, when you were kind of talking about that that sort of painter analogy that Another trap people might fall into is if they kind of just kind of leave every leave their daily actions, leave their business building to, you know, the whims of their emotions, and they might easily get burnt out, or they might not be as productive as they could be if this whole machine was in place. Well, see, then that's the whole problem with the MVP, uh, lean startup, agile startup methodology, where people say, "Oh, fail fast, fail forward." There's an emotional cost and a time cost and a money cost every time you fail. And even if you sit down and plan it, you're going to have failures and setbacks, on, uh, setbacks along the way. But if you don't, if you're just doing the throw it on the wall and see what sticks methodology, I guarantee you it takes a really emotionally strong person to get up back on their feet after the fifth or sixth time they've been knocked down. And so all I'm saying is, Take the time to look at, especially if you're doing anything in tech, you're doing any kind of applications, who are you selling this thing to? Why would they buy it? 
you know, how do you differentiate against the 2.5 million applications that are on Google Play and the App Store? How do you how are you going to be different to stand out? And really think about that because otherwise it takes a toll. Every you know, even if you've got just a huge ego and huge self-confidence, you're still going to take a hit every time something doesn't work. And what I'm saying too is if you have a game plan and it doesn't break your way, at least you'll have a clue about why it didn't break your way instead of, hey, it didn't work and I don't know why. Awesome. And I can completely relate to that. Where like if if there's that setback, if the, if the product launch didn't go well or something like that, then that way at least I have something to look at and I can say okay well logically I can see well because you know this number was low like I didn't have enough traffic or you know the conversion rate was low or something like that I can say right okay now that's the logical reason why that happened and now I don't just keep taking it personally and like you said I don't keep failing six seven eight times and then saying you know why the heck am I doing it it's almost like if I have if I have that evidence to help me out, I can say, well, I was sort of on the right track, but I was only ninety percent of the way there, and like this one piece was wrong, or I need to do more of that. Like I, com- I can completely relate to that. Where if I have some of that extra evidence, then I don't have to just kind of take that all or nothing kind of hit there. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny you mentioned about conversions because we're struggling with something right now because we're we're launching. Um, We've developed a methodology for really figuring out any kind of idea, but we've applied it to business, and we're trying to sell it as uh, both uh, distance learning and also in-person seminars, right? So we came up with this really great Facebook ad and Instagram ad that, you know, if you get more than like 2% 2 on clicks, that's that's a hit, right? We're getting like 6.5% conversion from the ad to our our, uh, landing page. Dud. Landing page sucks. But see, if you think about those pieces and how those different segments, then when things don't do it, you know exactly where you failed and why you failed. You know, if you if you just like, oh, well, some some bloke told me to go do a, a, an ad and it needs to connect to some landing page. It needs to connect to other things. And you don't learn about what conversions are and reasonable conversion rates and really understand the underpinnings of that. Then you're just going to you're going to give up because you're going to get frustrated. Makes makes a lot of sense, and, and it sounds like once you sort of know where the hurt is, where the problem is, then you'll be able to reattack the problem with focus just on that area. Kind of like you know, like that construction analogy of if you're building a house and like one, I don't know, one one wooden beam or something is is cut too long. Well, then you can say, okay, I only need to recut that one beam. I don't have to bulldoze the whole dang house and start over. Yeah, exactly. And see, that's the thing, too, that you're going to find your listeners who are looking to do things where they're going to require investors. The investors now, the whole the whole goal line has moved in terms of, I mean, I was back, I'm, I'm old enough for, that I was involved in the dot-com boom. And back, basically, if you said dot-com, shopping cart, and internet, people wrote checks. Now, People want you to be in business. They want you to be making some money. You need to have a prototype of what you're doing. And so that becomes more and more understanding who you're selling to. And this is why it's like if you don't do anything else, if you don't do anything else, sit down and figure out specifically who you're selling to and why they're buying from you. Because if you're selling to anybody or any or, or everybody, you're selling to nobody. And so you've got to figure out exactly who. And so if you don't figure out the numbers, you don't figure out anything else, just sit down and figure out who that customer is and you need to be able to see them clearly, then you got a shot. And I'm telling you, especially when you're dealing with investors, if you cannot make that identification, you're going nowhere. Awesome. Really good advice. And so sort of along those lines, I mean, are there like a series of like just like really like basic fundamental like questions that a lot of business owners out there should be asking and aren't asking like for example like that the whole question of who you're selling to are there other like things like that or just that are just like super simple and basic and yet a lot of people like don't even look for those kinds of things yeah i think that i think the number one is the number one thing one is is who the customer is and how you're going to reach them. In other words, you need to look at them demographically, psychographically, in terms of you know uh, where they are physically located. If you have a physical location, you need to cite your business as close to the people who are going to buy from you as you can. And so that whole customer identification is like the first big bubble that you've got to deal with. And then the second piece, which is totally counterintuitive and which most people don't want to deal with because they want to deal with the next part I'm going to talk about first, which is what I'm selling. 
especially in the tech space. It's like, look how great it is. Look at all these features. You know, people don't care about you. They care about them. They care about their problems, the things they want to get solved. And so in this customer identification piece of it, you learn all the things that they want fixed. You learn everything that they're about. And then you design the product to fit their need as opposed to designing the product and going out and trying to sell it to people. And if I could think of the biggest mistake we've made in our business was we focused on developing products that we knew would work, knew would, would be great. But the problem is then we had to educate people why they needed to have it, as opposed to finding the need and the pain point for the customer and saying, hey, I can make this better, or I can make you a rock star, or you're going to feel better, or you're going to look like Beyonce, whatever it is you're trying to sell. And then you and then they see themselves in your product, and then they reach for their wallet. And it's so much easier when you do it that way. Awesome. And that makes perfect sense on so many levels, just that the, uh, like the, the product itself or whatever you're solving, I mean, if you look at that customer first and look at you know, where, where they're getting stuck, what their needs and problems are, then and that makes perfect sense where, as opposed to trying to shove something down their throat. And then, you know, I've also seen a lot of that, and, and maybe it's, I don't know if it's been happening more recently or I've been noticing it more recently, but I'm just noticing a lot of, like, email marketers and stuff have been super centered around themselves. Like, just oh, talk, yeah. talking yeah. about, like, their accomplishments or how many hours they spent on that. I'm like, well, what's in it for me, dude? It's the curse of the familiar. Right. We are all cursed uh, to, about dealing with what we know and what we're comfortable with. And everybody loves me. Right. Because it's all about me. And that's the same way your customer feels. So the people who are really successful, gar- regardless of how you feel about them as human beings or people, guys like Steve Jobs and stuff like that, they went out and they said they didn't say, hey, look how great. Well, actually, Steve Jobs did kind of say, look how great we are. But. He, he listened to his customer base and he identified his customer base and then not only did he create products that they wanted to have because they were functional and beautiful and cool, but then think back to like – I remember like when the iPad – rolled out and you can probably still remember not the iPad but the iPod when that rolled out and the commercials were nothing but silhouettes of people dancing. Right. Right. And cool people, cool people with cool hair and cool clothes. Right. Well, who doesn't want to be the cool people, cool person? Right. So whether you're identifying with the functionality they they need or how they want to feel or who they want to be, you've got to identify them. And I'm I'm just telling you, we've done over 500 business plans. We've worked with thousands of, of clients. And I, if I had to pick the number one problem, that's it. All the other problems of making sure you buy stuff at a lower price than you sell it for, making sure that you account for stuff so you don't lose track of your money. All of these things are really important things. And if you go to things like SCORE or SBA, and they'll try to teach you about that stuff. But the single most important thing they never talk about, and it's who the freaking customer is. Because otherwise, if you, you want them to love you and include you in their lives, so therefore you've got to find out how to be their friend in a way that they need you to be. Awesome stuff, and that's a really cool perspective. In that, I, mean, I can totally see that it happening where a lot of people will be like writing a business plan, but like totally skip over that that really fundamental kind of thing, and then do all this work for a product that no one's going to buy no matter what. And so, you know, you talked a little bit there about like, um, you know, how companies like Apple and and people like that kind of have that cool factor. And like, I mean, is that always necessary? And like, is there a, a trick to being cool as a, as a, aside from just uh, figuring out what the customers want? Like, is there a, some sort of way of, of forcing that coolness? <laughs> well, let me tell you, I want to think I'm cool, but I constantly find out in different situations that I'm not. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's about credibility, right? Cool is just a different kind of credibility. So, like, if I'm in the financial services world, and I spend a lot of time in that world, um, cool is cool over there is the guy who knows what he's doing, knows the market, has a good grasp of how everything works, the mechanics of it, and can basically touch any of those levers at any time they need to do it. That's their credible. Apple was credible because they created these super slick, super cool products that did exactly what people wanted, didn't do stuff they didn't want, didn't want or didn't need. Because that's another thing you see a lot of is people just throw everything in and there's so much information and so many features to, to, to get at that people go, they just glaze over. I mean, I just, sometimes people just want a screwdriver. They don't need a screwdriver and a wrench and a hammer, right? So 
forcing cool, I don't think you force cool. I think what you do is you find out what your audience thinks is cool and then you position yourself in relationship to them so they will recognize the things that they value and think are cool in how you present yourself. Awesome. So just going back to that uh, that kind of see what they're going through as opposed to just what, what you think is interesting. And even as you were uh, explaining that, it made me think of, again, like that uh, when the iPod came out, when the iPhone came out, and that was around the time when like when uh, Bill Gates or Steve Ballmer, when they would be like doing their keynotes, they'd use all kinds of, you know, words. And, and, and I think they analyzed at one point, like uh, Microsoft and Bill Gates and all of them used like super long words. And then when Steve Jobs did his, his uh, unveilings, there'd be like a slide with like one word. Or the thing that really sticks in my mind is when uh, the iPods came out, they would say, you know, this stores three million songs. They wouldn't tell yeah. you, you know, 20 gigabytes. Maybe they'd kind of put yeah. that in later on, but just to kind of, for the masses, say, you know, the average person, like your grandma, doesn't even know what a, a gigabyte is. But we say, well, you know, three million songs, that's something that everyone can kind of relate to. And, and you know, even like a 15-year-old a or a 95-year-old both think that's cool. People want results. People want an end result. They don't care about how you get there. And let me tell you something. ADHD ADHD is not a condition that you're born with or you acquire. Society gives it to you. People are in their cell phones. For example, to produce the average music video now is 3 to $5 million because it has as many cuts in it as a feature film. And so everything in, in society is conspiring for people to have shorter and shorter attention spans. So if they're not taking the time to digest a whole bunch of information, they're going to be acting primarily on one thing, emotion. They're going to react to things on an emotional level, and then they're going to use their rational thought when they choose to use it to justify their emotional decision. And the biggest breakthrough we ever had was when we realized that, when we realized that people buy on emotion. So when people come to us, whether they're looking for a business plan or their business is in trouble and they need to get it back on its feet or they're looking for funding or, or any of the things that we do, the first thing that we try to do with working with that client is to connect with them on an emotional level and understand what it is that's really troubling them and affecting them so that we can feed that back and mirror them emotionally. And so in cases where you're doing email marketing or you're doing video or you're doing Instagram video or whatever you're doing – you still have that same obligation. We have a, a client, Alexander Petora, who does fashion on, on Instagram, and she is an expert at understanding the people who follow her, how they handle things emotionally, and she can bring in some little bit of pathos, and she can be funny, and she can be silly, but she's really su appropriate, and her audience is growing geometrically because she's not trying to figure out what they want in terms of, here's the thing I can offer you to make your life better. It's how are they going to feel better more secure, more whole, more worthy, just all of those emotional things because we live in it. I mean, look what just happened last year. We live in an incredibly emotional time. And so you need to ride that wave. Awesome. And, and it sounds like if people sort of focus more on emotion as opposed to all these features, it sounds like maybe there's, there's more – uh, like like thinking and meditating about it involved, but then when it comes time to actually you know do the marketing or do the work, there's there's less like less work on that end as as far as like you don't have to like write a lot, you don't have to do a lot of stuff. It's more like it sounds like a lot more like sort of compress, get to the point, get to the emotional stuff in your marketing. Thank you. Now you've actually validated everything we do because that's we like we do like this, this course we're offering. A whole lot of it focuses on visualization and visualization is nothing more than guided meditation you are saying i'm thinking about this subject and i'm trying to imagine like we have a, a client right now it's opening a restaurant what does it look like what does it sound like is it noisy is it the kind of place where people have quiet conversations do you hear is the kitchen out front you watch them fix the food imagine all these different kinds of configurations and at some point the people you're trying to attract will line up in your visualization so you're exactly right the more time you spend thinking about it, you, it goes down, then you're going to be able to cut, boil it down to a one-word slide or a two-word slide or a bunch of colors or a silhouette dancing on a bright screen. And people go, I get that. That's me. I want to be that. That's exactly all. That's all it is. Awesome. It's all – 
<laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, like, as you're describing that, it almost kind of, for, for me, takes me back to stuff like think and grow rich. Like, like th- think ahead to what you want, and then once you have that picture, then you'll be able to sort of get rid of all the other nonsense that you don't want. Like, even like you said there, you imagine that restaurant. Well, is it going to be a loud restaurant? Well, that kind of makes a lot of decisions there for you. Is it going to be a quiet yes. one? That kind of saves you the time of going in all these you got it. paths. You got it. And as a matter of fact, the methodology that we use is based on a thing called the master key, which was something that Napoleon Hill, the writer of Think and Grow Rich, believed in. It's also the foundation of the secret, but not with all that, you know, hearts and flowers, BS stuff, just wish for it and it will happen kind of thing because you got to do the work. But the visualization, the going into the theater of your mind and seeing it on the screen of your mind, the future, creating a destination for you to aim at, now you can figure out strategy. And from the strategy, you can develop tactics. And from the tactics, you can actually launch and reach out and develop methods because you have to tell people what you want them to do. You can't just assume they're going to figure it out. You've got to tell them exactly what you want to do. This is the biggest place where people fail. They ask for help but they don't tell people what they want them to do. And you can't tell them what they want, what you want them to do until you figured it out. Awesome stuff. I, I mean, th- this is all great, not just from like a, a business building kind of perspective, but like, and like marketing, but like a life advice uh, kind of thing in general, like, you know, knowing what you want and, and knowing how to relate to people. And I want to make sure that everyone knows, you know, all about you and all about uh, custom BPS and, you know, some of those services that you provide that you mentioned. So can you kind of tell everyone about uh, your website and about all these different things that you do? Okay, so if you go to our website at www.custombps.com, there's all kinds of videos. We also have a YouTube channel, um, and it, you watch some of the videos, you'll get a really good flavor of what we do. There's also, for those who are not vid- vis- visually oriented, we also have a, uh, you can read through a lot of different stuff about our philosophy and all the different industries we've worked in. We do three basic things. We help people plan businesses, whether they're a startup, they're an existing business, and they want to expand, and so we help them visualize how they're going to get to that specific destination. The second thing we do is we work with businesses that want to grow. They're either root-bound or stymied. They're not growing forward. They're not growing fast enough, or they could be actually be in trouble, and we can help turn them around from a process perspective so they run better. And then the third thing is uh, anybody that works with us on a startup and a lot of expansions, we help them source funding, and that funding can be Bank, SBA, bank, commercial loans, um, investors, venture capital, and private equity. And we've worked with venture capital and private equity firms over the last five years. So we've got a pretty good Rolodex of people where if you come in with a business idea, we can say, eh, you're not going to fund it the way you think you can. Maybe you can fund it or this is great. Here's the person and I can give you a phone number to call. So those are the three basic things we do. And we are really good at them. <laughs> Awesome. It sounds like it. And so uh, all you guys listening, like if you have a business, which I assume you do since you're listening to this podcast, in whatever stage you're in, if you're still planning it, if you're a startup, you're looking to expand it, or you're growing a business or looking for that funding, make sure to go to custombps.com, C-U-S-T-O-M-B-P-S.com, and check out those videos that uh, Peter has on the page Call them on the phone if you need help or fill in that contact form if you uh, have any kind of questions about his products or the services that he provides. And so thanks so much, Peter, for coming on the show and dispensing all of this really cool business advice. But it's uh, it's it's been simplified and sort of gotten to the point, the way that things need to be at this day and age so that everyone can understand it. So thanks for dishing that sort of business advice, that life advice, and all that cool stuff that you had to offer us. Can I do one more thing? Just go one more it. thing. Let's do it. If you, if you go to our website uh, or you call us on our toll-free number, 800-741-8444, and you mention the Robert Plank Show, we will send you an electronic copy of Killer Business Plan. Awesome. So make sure to do that because, I mean, who doesn't like free stuff and who doesn't want that free copy of the Killer Business Plan? So uh, 800-741-8444 or that uh, contact form at custombps.com. Make sure to tell them Robert Plank sent you. And thanks, Peter, for uh, tell- giving them, them that extra call to action there. All right, man. It's a blast. Thank you so much for having me on. Please take a second to rate and subscribe to The Robert Plank Show in the iTunes Store. It's free robertplank.com slash iTunes.